Hi, this is Pastor Tim Bagwell. I'm so glad that you're watching. I've got such an incredible word to share with you today. I believe it's going to impact your mind, your spirit, your body, your finances, because there's something about the word. The word will make you free. I know that God cares about you and he cares about your family. He wants to touch your loved ones that are lost. He wants to heal the family member that's sick. He wants to help you be the person that God has called you and ordained you to be. I know that what you're getting ready to hear is going to liberate you, encourage you, and give you strength to face the battles that you're about to face in the future. Well, remember this, we care about you, we're praying for you, for your family, and most of all, remember, you are who God says you are. Let's all stand across the house for the reading of the word. In the first chapter of Luke, in the first chapter of Luke, the 26th verse, it reads this way. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and, of the, vir and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored, and the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I, uh, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zechariah and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salvation, of salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. The babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Father, anoint every ear to hear, every mind to perceive, and every heart to believe in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, just say these words with me. The babe leaped in my womb for joy. You may be seated. I want to preach to you about joy to the world. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. When I was studying, and I know how Pastor Gala kind of alluded to this earlier, but I know how you all are today because this time of year does create great added pressure to a degree. I have been almost killed numerous times in the mall. <laughs> you know, it's bad enough to deal with people that are trying to shop because they're very focused, especially men, because they do not know what they're doing to begin with. But now we have all the technology. 
And so people are walking down the malls looking at their iPhones. They've got their little earbuds in. And all this is going on on top of all of the decision making that has to be made. And I mean, I have been in stores. I have been almost plowed under by uh, people out of every culture and every nationality known to man. I'm not going to blame any particular race or any particular nationality. It is across the board, and it has been so many different times. Driving is another adventure. And please don't take somebody's parking place that they think they're going to get. I have relinquished parking places for the fear of my life. It was mine. I was there first. Now, when my mother was alive, I had her handicapped sticker. <laughs> and because anywhere she went, I took her. I had the handicap thing to hang on my... So I thought, well, in spirit, she's here. I did get some strange looks when I got out of the car and I'd run into stores and they're looking at the handicap sticker or the little lanyard or whatever it's called that was hanging on my mirror. But it's a crazy time of year. We have the normal pressures of life. We have all the things that we have to be doing. We have all the job responsibilities. We have all the normal family responsibilities. And now we've got to figure out what to buy people and uh, that have a lot of things already. And we're trying to find that perfect, significant gift that'll warm the heart of your spouse. And even though you threw them under the bus in front of hundreds of people, they're going to love you anyway. And I have done that. Amen. Uh, I don't remember what I bought, but it was good. <laughs> but you know, Christmas has become so much about the shopping and about the gifts and about the family gatherings, but the whole story of Christmas has to do with joy. I mean, when you really stop. And so I, I was researching some things, and I love this segment of Scripture because Mary was carrying the Christ, and as a preacher, the symbolism of this is so powerful. Now she has become the container or Christ was within her, the hope of humanity, she walks into a room, and she's just a young woman, and she's walking into the room or the home of her, husband, uh, her cousin Elizabeth, and when she walks into the home of Elizabeth, she greets her and probably said shalom, because that was a common Jewish greeting, and she probably said shalom. And uh, when she said shalom, the Bible says that the babe leaped in her womb for joy. And instantly, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, I just want you to stop and think here. This was before the shed blood on the cross. This was before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And all Mary did, she walked in, and within her body was the Son of the living God. And she says, hello. And when she says, hello, the presence of God comes upon Elizabeth, and God fills Elizabeth with the Holy Ghost, and I want you to get a bigger picture of this. The Bible said the baby leaped in her womb. Now, I don't know how this happened. You ladies that have carried a child have felt that child kick and move, and I, I remember when Gayla was carrying both the boys, there was just times, there was a lot of activity going on, and the kicking and the movement and everything else, but there was something powerful that hit John in the womb of Elizabeth, and there's only three times this word, uh, joy, appears from this Greek word. And in all three times, it meant to leap, to dance, or to skip for joy. It not just put a smile on your face, but there was a whole lot of activity going on when he in her womb in the sixth month was hearing the sound of the voice of the woman that was carrying the Christ. I've had so many people say, uh, you know, when they're carrying their children that uh, 
I'd begin to preach and the baby would begin to kick and move. And then other people tell stories about any time they put music on, the baby would begin to move and kick. This baby heard the voice of the woman that had the Christ within her. And when she did, that baby started dancing. Now, I don't think you think that's what happened, but I do. I think when John heard the sound of the carrier of the Christ, there was something in that little six-month baby that was six months in the womb that put a dance in his little feet before he ever breathed his first breath of oxygen. This is what Christmas is all about. Christmas is about joy. Christmas is about understanding unto us a child is born, unto to us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name shall be wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. There's something about Christmas that has to do with joy. It doesn't have to do with sadness and sorrow even though we've all had to walk through having a moment in time at this time of year that certain people aren't with us that used to be. Christmas is still about joy. Because if it had not been for that baby that was born in Bethlehem, this world would never know any kind of joy. All this world would know would be artificially induced things that make us smile from drugs or from alcohol or just from mere natural acquisitions. But I'm talking about something that you will smile even though your circumstances are not perfect. I'm talking about a joy that will cause your feet to dance even when you feel like, my God, why did this go wrong or why did that go wrong? But there's something in the side of you that says, I'm going to praise God in the middle of the fire of my life. That's the joy Jesus brought. Jude one twenty four said this, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory, with exceeding joy. Every time you think about your salvation and that one day you're going to stand before God and even though you don't deserve it, you're going to be, listen to what Jude says here. And I said 124, but it's really Jude 24 because there's only one chapter. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless, present you faultless, Present you faultless, man, before the presence of his glory. There's coming a moment in time that you're going to stand in the presence of God's glory and you're not going to be nervous. Stop and think about that. Because he's going to present you faultless. And then it wraps up talking about exceeding joy. Now, the word exceeding means excessive. And this is the definition. Exceeding means excessive, very, very, very much. So when you talk about exceeding, you're talking about very, very, very much. So what's he saying here? You're going to stand in the presence of God with exceeding very, very, very much excessive joy, which comes from the same Hebrew derivative of the baby leaped for joy, which means you're going to stand in the presence of God faultless, and you're going to bust a move. Very, very, very excessive joy. Because you're going to stand before God and God's going to open his arms and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And you realize that all the condemnation and all the accusation and they're, oh God, I hope they don't show him this and I hope they don't rewind the tape to this point. No, you, you're going to stand before him faultless. He's going to open his arms and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And the same kind of joy that hit little John in the womb is going to hit you. And you're going to have a very, 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 very much excessive joy. And I'm telling you something. We have more to be happy about than anybody on the planet. 
It doesn't have to do with how much money you have. It doesn't matter how much, what kind of car you wheeled up in. It doesn't matter that you live in America or you have the best home in the neighborhood. You have a hope that you're going to stand before God someday, faultless, and you'll be able to look at God and bust a move and leap and skip and dance because your sins have been washed away and you are found faultless in his presence and you're going to do just what little John the Baptist did. You're going to leap for joy because God's going to open his arms and say, Welcome, thou good and faithful servant. So we think about Christmas. So we think about there's so much that was written about John the Baptist in conjunction with the Christmas story. And then you go over into Luke, the second chapter and the 10th verse. Now the angels appear, and the angel says this, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Everybody say, great joy. He didn't say, I bring you good tidings of joy. He said, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Hmm. Great comes from the Greek magus, which means mighty, but here's the part I like, intense joy intense joy so now I bring you good news I bring you good tidings of intense joy now the word joy there comes from chara and joy is one of these words that you have to look at it more it, it's almost like a verb more than it's a noun but when you look up a definition of joy this is what one um, definer says, an emotion of evoked by well-being or success or an expectation of good. So if you're walking in joy, you, you have something stirring in you that's invoked by well-being or success. It's an expectation of good. So, in some ways, you know, we get happy and joy mixed together because they are mixed together. So, sometimes there's a happiness or a joy because of what's happening around us. But other times, when it goes deeper, it's an expectation of good. You ever notice the kids, when they walk in and you start putting gifts under the tree? There is an expectation of good. Now, I've known Tatavio. It's so good to have you and your lovely wife here from New York. And uh, it's nice for you to come and see your mother. Because she's, she prays for you. And tells me to pray for you. <laughs> and then tells me to pray for your wife. And so, but we're so glad you're here, Tatavio. But I've known you since you were, what, like three years old? Three or five? You were much younger than you are now. You're very, very, very very old now. You've had many, many, many card showers in your life. We can't even remember how many. But, you know, back when you were a little boy and you'd walk out there and you'd see those gifts, right? there was an expectation of good. Now, Aaron was our Christmas baby. He wasn't born on Christmas, but he was the one that really sucked in the oxygen of Christmas. And Aaron would make out his list, and Santa was supposed to check it twice. But at the end of Christmas, Aaron would bring his list out to make sure we had gotten him everything on his list. And he would count how many gifts Adam got. And if Adam got more gifts than he did, he made sure it was pointed out to us, Adam got nine gifts, I only got eight. But when the tree went up, now we used to put up the tree sometimes before Thanksgiving but not after Aaron got bigger. Because when the tree went up, Aaron started bouncing off the walls. When the gifts went under the tree, it became another level of the expectation of good. Then the skipping started, the dancing, the leaping, the bouncing off the walls, and uh, the shaking of the packages, and all of that. And I know none of you were ever guilty. Did any of you ever sneak a peek at your Christmas gifts? Come on. My parents used to hide at gifts 
and thought I didn't know where they hid them. And I knew every gift because I'd always sneak down there and look in the closet. And I'd go through the bags. Oh, I check that one off. I don't need to ask for that anymore. I'm like, oh, they haven't got that yet. Well, I'll press the issue on the tennis shoes because they haven't got those yet. But, but, but the, we have this expectation of good. And you should live in a place. My God, uh, somebody needs to help me. You need to live in a place of joy. You need to live in a place of an expectation of good. You don't need to be expecting disease. You don't need to be expecting depression. You don't need to be expecting uh, financial ruination. You need to have an expectation of good. So the angel comes to the shepherds and they said, I bring you good tidings, good news of great, mega, mega joy. Everybody say mega. Mega joy. Mega expectation of good. Mega of an emotion of well-being or success. Because when Jesus is not on the scene, there is no success. When Jesus is not on the scene, there is no well-being. When Jesus is not on the scene, there is no good. But when he shows up, there is success. When he shows up, there is good. When he shows up, ladies and gentlemen, you've got to understand something. There is a sense of well-being that only he can bring. So great joy. Wasn't this joy? He said, with great joy, which shall be to all people. Isn't that amazing? God wants all of you to have great joy. You know, and sometimes, I, I think sometimes church is kind of like an ER ward, you know. It's like people are coming through the doors and they broke this and uh, they're in pain about this, and they don't feel well about this. And man, some Sundays I, I look out there and say, Lord, have mercy. And I'm looking for one person out of the whole crowd. Is there anybody got any joy out there? Yeah, and so, but he said, now the great joy which shall be to all people. So for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. His name shall be Wonderful, Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So it's for all of us. He's not just mine. He's yours. And he's not just here to give me joy. He's here to give you joy. And, and, and this is why the angels came to the shepherds. Because there was quite a few of them. And when you talk about just representing the common man, the shepherds represented the common man. But he said, get ready. You're going to get the greatest sense of well-being you've ever had. The greatest sense of success you've ever had. And you're going to have the greatest expectation of good that you've ever had. You know, we get a little jaded when we come to this time of the year because we, then we go into spin and talk about New Year's. And everybody, oh man, next year's going to be, you know, I'm already getting texts. We're believing that next year will be the greatest year you've ever had. And we're believing next year will be a, a blessed year. And believing next year will be a year of breakthroughs. You know what I'm talking about. And sometimes we get jaded, say, oh yeah, yeah. But the truth of the matter is, if we have joy, we have that expectation. No, you fell asleep again. You're tired from the mall and you're trying to figure out how all the gifts are going to give you that you don't want, how you're going to take them all back and not offend anybody. I, I know where you're at. No, we need to enter into 2019 with an expectation of good. I want you to look at any area of your life right now that's not walking in good and start expecting that that is going to be eradicated and changed. And if you're not feeling well physically, you need to get an expectation of health. That's where joy is. If, if, if you have financial problems and you need to have an expectation of a breakthrough financially, if you have emotional issues, depressions, discouragement, then get an expectation that you're going to have joy and you're going to have peace because faith is about expectation hope is about expectation and when you're walking in expectation then what you're walking in is something that has to do with the joy of the Lord now go to Matthew 2 10 this is a, now we hit John the Baptist Elizabeth and now we're with the wise men now 
you know, the shepherds, they were just kind of blue-collar kind of guys, you know. So they're the kind of guys, you know, that could come to church and bust a move and leap and shout. But now we're dealing with scientists. Now we're dealing with intellectuals. Now we're dealing with men who have researched with the stars and all that they have studied, with the high level of university quality education, some of the smartest men in the world. And we know they're not going to get excited because intellectual people do not get spiritually excited. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Oh, let's cap this off. Now, we're talking about some of the smartest men in the world. They didn't just say when they saw the star, they had joy. No, they rejoiced. Everybody say rejoiced. So that meant they were in a state of jubilation, celebration. Do you know, are you catching it? Have you ever had some jubilation in your life? Now, some things push different people's buttons. Maybe you got a huge breakthrough financially and you had great jubilation and maybe even had a party to say, oh, praise God, got a breakthrough financially or uh, uh, whatever it might be. So number one, they were jubilant and they were celebratory. Number two, it was, let's see, now what? Exceeding. So back again, it was excessive. It was very very, very much great, which is mega, which means intense. Now, we have some of the most brilliant men in the world. So they're jubilant and celebratory. They are in a very, very, very much excessive state of jubilant and celebratory. And then... They are jubilant, celebratory, very, very, very much excessive, but yet it's mighty and it's intense. But remember, they're smart. And some of you think you're too smart to get jubilant. Some of you think you're too intellectual to get celebratory. Some of you think you're too sophisticated to bust a move and skip and leap and dance, but not these guys. And then the joy, they had an emotion of well-being. They had a sense of success. They had an expectation of good. Now, this is a picture of the Magi that I don't think you've ever had. I think when they saw the star, I think when they realized their search had not been in vain, I think they got off their camels. They began to shout. They began to dance. They began to lift their voices up. It wasn't some, excuse me, reverent, dignified thing. It was very, very, very much excessive, intense. My God, have you ever praised him with some intensity? They were celebrating. They used to say, oh, there's the star. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. How I wonder who you are. Let's have a moment of silence. Oh. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Oh, this is a special time. This is a special moment. Um. No, they saw the star and they started celebrating. When the Broncos finally won a Super Bowl. <laughs> were you at the house that night, Dottavi? Were you with us? You were there eating my food, weren't you? That was one of the things that you and Michael were very good at is coming to my house. Michael more so with the food than you. And when they put that game away, and it, uh, I'm sorry, Chris, 
when, when, when the Green Bay Packers, who everybody in the world said were going to annihilate the feeble, uh, second-rate, don't deserve to be in the Super Bowl Broncos. When the mighty Brett Favre and all the pro bowlers from the preceding year that had won the Super Bowl entered into the arena and Shannon Sharp prophesied and said, I guarantee victory. And everybody thought Shannon Sharp was the goof that we found him out to be. But on that moment, he was God's man. And he prophesied the victory. And John Elway, with all his pain and suffering from all the years of Super Bowl losses and the beating that he took through the years and his body racked with pain but yet he reached down deep inside himself and as he moved toward the goal line the Packers hit him with everything and he the, the helicopter moment and John got the first down and we proceeded to win one of the most exciting Super Bowls uh, in Super Bowl history unless you were a Packer fan and what ends up happening when it was over and nobody in our house could believe oh, we're going to screw it up we're going to blow it it's not going to work out but they won and when they won I ran to the front door and I opened the front doors I said yes I didn't ask for a moment of silence. Let's all have a moment of silence. Let's remember our dear Packer fans who are in grief right now. No, 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 no. It was time to celebrate. And I couldn't keep it to myself. I said, I'm getting in my car. I'm going to drive down the road. I'm putting my brights on. I'm going to start honking the horn. I'm going to start yelling out the window. And I drove all over Lone Tree, all over Highlands Ranch. And everybody else was like, yes! And then I went by side, yes! And then I'd get near somebody else, yes! I was celebrating. Because I'd seen the star. I saw a star I thought I'd never see. See, they saw a star that they kind of wondered, is this going to lead me where I think I should go? And when they found out it led them where they thought they should go, they rejoiced. They celebrated. They were jubilant. They had very, very, very much exceeding, intense, great expectations. And these were the wise men. Have you had any exceeding great joy lately? Is there anything worth shouting about? Is it, is it worth the expectation of the good of knowing? You're going to stand blameless one day, and you're going to dance in his presence. No, no. I'm not talking about the new car smell now. I'm not talking about your Christmas bonus now. I'm not talking about what's wrapped under the Christmas tree. I'm talking about something that extends past when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. That's what I'm talking I'm talking about joy. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Now I've got I got to read some things to you, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm wrapping it up here, sorta. Of. Because you finally woke up. Psalm five eleven. Let all those that put their trust in Thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy, because Thou defends them. Every day, I ought to be rejoicing. I ought to be celebrating because he defends me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. He's my shield, my buckler, 
my great reward. Because of the blood, he stands in front of the doorway of my house and will not allow the destroyer to come in and strike me down. What am I talking about here? I'm talking about not just saying, oh man, I'm happy. No, I'm talking about shouting for joy. You ought to get up every day and say, listen, this is going to be a victory day because the Lord is the defender of me. This is going to be a blessed day. The Lord is the defender of me. I think I'm going to have to open the front doors and give him a shout of joy. Hmm. Psalm 30 verse 5 said, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy, and the word joy there again means a shout of joy or a shout of triumph. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. For every nighttime hour you have ever had, there is a morning. Come on, there is a joy in the morning. There is a moment of triumph. There is a shout of triumph. You don't open your front doors and shout the victory when you've lost. You open the front doors and shout the victory because you have the triumph. Some of you have had victory after victory after victory this year, but you've gotten so cute that you won't give him the kind of shout that he's worthy of. Like I said, when finally we won that game, it was the biggest win in the history of football in the city of Denver. And for me to bend my knee and go into a moment of silence didn't fit because it was a victory. And when you have great victories, there ought to be a shout. When you have great breakthroughs, there ought to be a shout. It shouldn't just be a golf clap. It should be an applause. It should be, do it again, Lord. It should be a standing O. It should should be something of intensity, something of power, something of greatness, because you've wept through the night, but now the victory has come. Joy to the world. Joy to the world. Not just joy for Tim Backwell. Joy to the world. Not just joy for, for my wife. Joy to you. Joy for your neighbor. Joy in Asia, joy in Europe, huh? joy in Australia, joy in New York, joy in California, joy! Oh my God, my God. Nehemiah 18, 8 verse 10 just simply said, For the joy of the Lord is your strength. You know why we got so many weak folk in the church? Nobody's shouting anymore. Nobody's praising anymore. Nobody's celebrating anymore. All we want to do is bring our prayer requests. I need this, Lord. Yeah, but what about what I did? Yeah, I know, but that was then. This is now. The joy is your strength. No, you're not hearing me. I said the joy is your strength. You, if you're not strong, it's because there's a joy deficiency. There's a lack of an expectation of good. The joy is your strength. Now, let, let me read you another verse here. First Chronicles 16, 27. Glory and honor are in his presence. Strength. Oh, the joy is your strength. Strength and gladness, which is also joy, are in his place. His place. You know what this building is? It's his place. There's something you're going to get in his place that you're not going to get in your place. That's all I'm going to say about that. But I want you to hear. Strength in his presence is strength and joy in his place. When you get in his place, now I'm not, not every building that says it's a church is a church. Because he's not there. That's not his place. Because they bought in to that which diametrically opposes the truth. They are endorsing sin and behaviors that are contrary to the plan and the purpose and the word of God. That's not his place. Say, now, wait a minute. You wait a minute. Because I will not replace the truth of the scripture. So what happens? Strength and joy are in his place. And the joy is your strength. So if the joy is there, 
the strength is there. You didn't hear me. If the joy is there, the strength's there. If you're in his place, the joy's there and the strength's there. If you're in his place, the joy's there, so it is your strength. Every time you come into the house of his place, every time you're in the house of the Lord, you are in his place. So Donna, that means there's strength there. That means there's joy because where there's joy there is strength uh, but it's in his place uh, and your weeping may endure for the night uh, but the joy comes in the morning Uh, sometimes you need to roll over and say I don't need an extra hour's sleep I need to be in his place Uh, sometimes you need to say yeah I can hear the word online which is good uh, but I still need to be in his place Uh, there's something when you walk into the room uh, that has been dedicated uh, unto the praise and the worship of the Lord. You get in his place, you're going to get some joy. You get the joy, you're going to get the strength. Uh, All of a sudden, you'll throw your shoulders back and say, I don't know why I feel different. You know why you feel different? Because now you have an expectation of good. Okay, okay, I'm on a home stretch. I think... Psalm 1611 said, in thy presence is fullness of joy. In thy presence is fullness of joy. So that that could mean if there's a fullness of joy, there's also a half cup of joy. Are you with me? But see, God doesn't want you operating in half. He wants you operating in the fullness or in the overflow of joy. That's when it goes beyond happiness. Hmm. John 15, 11 said, These things have I spoken unto you that your joy might remain. Hmm. So I'm talking to you. And what was he talking about? I am the vine, you are the branches. He was talking about one of the greatest teachings Jesus ever gave. He said, so I'm saying all this to you that my joy might remain. So I want you to have the kind of joy I have. Now, he's getting ready to go and be crucified. But doesn't it say somewhere in the the writings of the apostles that with joy, he embraced the tragedy as men would look at it that was about to happen. So I want you to have my kind of joy, that my joy will remain in you and that your joy might be full. You know what you know you know what happiness is? Happiness is joy your flesh can create. Oh, this is good. You need to write out an extra hundred dollar offering for this. No, think about this. Happiness is the joy your flesh or your circumstances can create. Joy is what only God can create. How can you be heading to Calvary? And tell them, I want you to have my joy. Because his joy was not from his circumstance. His joy was from the heavens. And God has, when you hit full joy, you have divine joy. When you hit full joy, you can have more stress circumstantially you've ever had in your life. And there is still a shout on your lips. There is still laughter in you. Oh, I've been there that I haven't walked in it. I've been there when I faced the mountains and I could talk more about the mountain than I talked about the God that could move the mountain. I've been there when my hurt dominated my every step and fogged my thoughts and my thinking. I've been there when the stress uh, of the work of ministry, the stress of uh, family issues, whatever it might have been, just drained you. And all of a sudden I realized I'm weak because somewhere I lost my joy. But when I get my joy back, I get strong. But my joy doesn't come as great as you are, Tristan. It doesn't come by being in Tristan's presence, unless you're Alicia. No, when I get in his presence, 
And sometimes I walk in the floors of this auditorium all by myself. There's nobody in here but me and the Holy Ghost in the pews. But I get in his presence. And when I get in his presence, strength begins to come upon me. And he said, this, I, I'm, I'm giving you these words that my joy will continue, that you don't lose it, and that your joy may be full. So when everything's going wrong, you can still have a full cup. Thou anoints my head with oil, my cup runneth over. So I'm going to celebrate anyway. Uh, the, the great lyrical song they wrote years ago, Hallelujah, anyhow. But the truth of the matter is, you've got to have a hallelujah anyhow. No, you're not hearing me. I said, you've got to have a hallelujah anyhow. And when your joy is full, you'll hallelujah anyhow. When your joy is full, you'll give him a sacrifice of praise. When your joy is full, you're going to walk in something and say, I know what God has said. I know what God has declared. I know what God has prophesied. I know what God has promised. I know what his word says. I know the dream I have. I know the vision I have. And my joy is full because his word remains in me therefore his joy is in me somebody give him a shout oh my Isaiah 12 3 said therefore with joy shall you draw waters out of the wells of salvation you realize you can't get what's in me without joy it's a three digit pin number J-O-Y Explanation point. No, with joy, you draw waters out of the wells of salvation. You know who the wells of salvation are? It's apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. It are, it are vessels that are the containers of the gifts of God, of the anointing of God, the fruit of the Spirit, the power of the Holy Ghost. And you know how you pull on that? You pull on it with joy. So when you come in and all of a sudden you're entering in because God inhabits praise, you're celebrating. And it's not that... Uh, the worship team's making you celebrate. It's not pastor getting up and motivated. No, you're coming in. My joy is going to be full. I determine I'm not walking in carnal joy uh, that, that is motivated by circumstance. I'm walking in Holy Ghost joy that no matter what my circumstance is, I'm going to praise it. I'm going to skip. I'm going to leap. I'm going to dance. I'm going to shout. I'm going to clap. I'm going to lift my hands. And I'm going to do it very, very, very much. I'm going to do it excessively. I'm going to do it intensely. I'm going to celebrate. It's not going to be golf clap. It's going be standing ovation. It's not going to be a praise the Lord. It's going to be praise ye the Lord. I'm not going to give him half. I'm going to give him all. I'm not going to do it like men do it. I'm going to do it like a redeemed of the Lord will do it. Somebody help me today. Yeah. Go to Acts the 8th chapter. And he just simply said, now, they went down to Samaria, and they healed the sick. They cast out devils. They preached the good news. And the Bible said, and there was great joy in that city. There was great joy in that city. You know what? We've given up on our cities. We have given up on our cities. We, we watch CNN. We watch Fox. We hear, read the papers, we listen to the news reports, and we have given up on our cities. We, we see people going into positions of leadership that we don't quite get it and we don't get, a, we don't get understanding. We see uh, things going anti-church instead of pro-house of God. I've never lived through a decade of ministry that I've seen more antagonism toward the church. And it's, it's subtle. It's not feeding Christians to the lions in a sense in America, but yet Christians are being beheaded in other countries. And I've never seen the spirit of the Antichrist as prevalent. It's in the political scene. It's in the news scene. Uh, it, it, it's violently portrayed through radical Islam. It's portrayed in many different ways. Uh, but what I'm trying to get you to understand, the will of God is there is joy in our city. The world doesn't 
doesn't have the joy. Uh, the new age doesn't have the joy. They don't understand it. All they've got is a carnal reaction to circumstance. But inside of you is a joy that should be full. But if we've lost our shout, if we've lost our praise, if we've lost our dance, if we've lost our hungry to thirsty for the house of God, God needs you to be more than church attenders when it's convenient. Oh, I didn't get any hand claps on that. Well, Pastor, you just got to understand how busy I am. Who isn't busy? Look at your neighbor and say, I'm busier than you are. Then look, you, whoever said that didn't look back and say, no, I'm busier than you are. No, we all busy. We all have a story, and we all busy. We all have stress, and we all have pressure. We've all been hurt. Hello? We all have a family. Sounds of silence. We all got it. There is no temptation that is not common to man. I got business problem. Well, walk up three pews and find a business person. And then they can tell you their problems. And then you can tell them your problems. And then you can cry in the aisle and give each other a hanky. I got problems with the kids. I guarantee you, you don't have to go more than three pews. And then you can exchange handkerchiefs and talk about the problems of your kids. Oh, I, 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 I'm discouraged. Well, I guarantee you, you probably don't have to get off your pews. And you'll find somebody discouraged. But the Bible said there was joy in the city. Where's the joy coming from? The joy came from a vessel that was full of the power of the Holy Ghost. You are a joy dispenser. You are somebody that ought to bring rejoicing. You are somebody that ought to loose an expectation of good. But what do we do? We're so busy. We're so busy. I'm so tired. Well, where's your strength? Well, the joy is. Where's the joy? In his presence. Where's his presence? In his place. Now, nobody's hearing me now. Oh, maybe you online are listening. It. But what I'm trying to get through to you, if we are weary, we're weary because we don't have the expectation of good. We don't have the emotion, uh, for lack of a better term, that stirs us to know and to understand success is on the way. Victory is on the way. Miracles are on the way. When you wake up in the morning and say, this is the day the Lord hath made. Joy in the city. Look at your neighbor and say, it's time for joy in the city. Years ago, see, we, see, we the enemy subtly work things out to where everything's politically incorrect. I like the holidays when everybody's forced to tell me happy holiday. Now they don't even say anything to you. They just give you your bag. They're not even saying happy holiday now. Man, they hand me that bag and I, Merry Christmas. I'm going to Merry Christmas to you. <laughs> I'm kind of like got that Merry Christmas thing. Like I do the Aloha thing in Hawaii. I've been vastly persecuted for my Aloha spirit. <laughs> you know, when you're in Hawaii, everywhere you go, they Aloha. 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 And they are aloha, and he, aloha. And so Gaylor came, and I just said, hello. You know, I was just being a mainlander. So finally, I said, you, you got to start saying aloha. So we're walking down the sidewalk, and uh, a couple comes up and says, aloha. I said, aloha. <laughs> I just want to know I meant it. <laughs> Gaylor goes, you scared those poor people to half to death. I said, What? Oh, I was just very, very, very much intense, happy. Aloha! <laughs> so they hand me my bag and say, Happy holiday. I go, Merry Christmas! <laughs> and I've gotten cultural. I even say, Feliz Navidad! <laughs> Not sure what I'm saying, but Jose Feliciano sang it and made millions off of it. <laughs> but there's joy in the city. There's joy in the city. I was driving down the freeway. I don't know what I did. Some guy rolled his window down and flipped me off. 
I don't know what I did. <laughs> I'm in the parking lot. This woman starts backing up. I guess she wanted a parking place or something. She starts backing up. And so finally she gets like within a millimeter of my car and I honk the horn. And I didn't do it mean. I didn't go. <laughs> I just thunk, thunk, thunk. You know, that's, you're about to do something stupid. Don't do it. <laughs> Woman. Female. From Florida. Out of state. Has no business being here. <laughs> this is Colorado. Go back to Florida. Want to come up here and steal some of our snow. That's what they want. Get out of her car. Out of car in front of me. So I got cars behind me. You have six feet, seven inches behind you. I say, well, great. Yeah. Aloha. Please not be done to you. Say, what'd you do? Nothing. Did you back up? No. I became supernaturally passive aggressive. My wife, though, because, you know, now she's had so many birthdays that she doesn't quite have the grace she did years ago. Years and years and years and years ago. She said, I can't believe. I said, well, what am I supposed to do? Well, I, said, I can't believe I should talk to you. I said, well, she's from Florida. <laughs> and I wasn't doing what she wanted me to do. And she told me there was a wreck up ahead of us. We're in a parking lot. <laughs> so I just sat there. She finally moved. There was no wreck. And then we walk into the mall, and here she comes. <laughs> Had her little bag, and she was on her way to exchange it before she went back to Florida. <laughs> Gayla says, you need to go talk to her. I said, I don't want to talk to her. <laughs> and I have no idea where I'm at in my sermon right now. <laughs> Say what? I'm just working it out, folks. Well, you know, how ridiculous to get that upset in a parking lot. How ridiculous. I didn't move out of the entrance lane as quick as the guy wanted me to. How ridiculous. My Lord, I'm standing at a counter, and people just walk up and they just push you out of the way. I, I, I need therapy, folks. I need help because... There's got to be joy in the city. And when there's joy in the city, there's an expectation of good. There's an expectation of success. And we need to not have a very, very, very much intensity of anger. We need to have a very, very, very much intensity of joy. There ought to be celebration. There ought to be jubilation. Uh, and it ought to be infix, uh, infectious. And it ought to come out of you. And it ought to come out of me. And when we get our strength, it doesn't matter where we we are the joy of the Lord is our strength give him a shout today no I said a shout can't even move our feet for the one that's made us faultless. Why can we clap and scream so loud that a quarterback cannot hear nor his team can hear when he's calling out the signals because the unity of the stadium is with the home team. But yet if I say, let's give God a shout, we still don't give it what we'd give it at the stadium. Why do we celebrate less over our great victories that are eternal than we do over a raise or over something 
that excites us in the natural. But when you get divine joy, you'll shout in the fire. You'll shout in the prison. You'll shout when they hand you a bad report. You'll shout when they give you the pink slip because you know God's got a better job for you somewhere. Are you with me? You'll shout. So, well, that's, just, that's just not who I am. Well, those wise men were scientists. Someone gave us a, a video about the star of Bethlehem and we watched it. Lord have mercy. The brilliance of these men. But when they saw the star, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with exceeding great joy. I think if they'd have added anything else to that, they'd have killed themselves. Very, very, very much excessive, intense celebration, jubilation of an expectation of good joy to the world. Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. Do you know that song? I think it would be better if you did it than me. I want you, I want you, this was not written as a Christmas carol. What was the psalm, Gala, do you remember? The 98th psalm, I believe it's Psalm 98 is the origins of this, what we call a carol now. But when it's originally written, it wasn't written as a Christmas carol. It was just written as a great hymn extracted from that song. But I want you to sing it not with your typical Christmas kind of thing. I want you to really sing it because you are rejoicing with exceeding great joy because you've seen the star and it led you somewhere. Go ahead, guys. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Give him a shout of joy. 